So what's going on guys? Welcome back to the channel. In this video, I want to talk about pretty much everything motorbike related from the dangers of being on a motorbike, places to watch out for, places to go, the cost structure of a motorbike, things you should carry with yourself on the motorbike, and things that a passenger should know if you are a passenger on a motorbike, as well as general operating so features, how to generally operate yeah, like a bike. So yeah. stay tuned. So like first things thing. first, we're going to go ahead yeah. and go into cost. Good. How much does it cost to rent a motorbike? Well, this is going to vary based off of one, the location, two, the style of bike, and uh, three, the, long, the longevity of how long you're going to have that bike. So generally, in more touristy areas, you're going to be paying more. You're going to pay a premium because, well, there's just more people available than have to give you know, cheaper rates because they know people are coming. So. Um, again, in the touristy areas, you can look for anywhere between 100,000 rupiah to 200,000 rupiah per day. If you're going to be renting it out for multiple days, you can definitely swing a discount. You can definitely talk to them. Usually anything over three days, they're more willing to kind of work with you on the price and uh, give you a better rate. So what about the less touristy areas? So specifically in Lombok, where we visited we stayed there for I believe, seven to ten days i don't remember exactly we stayed there a while uh, we basically spent five weeks in total in bali or in the surrounding islands of bali uh, but lombok found, we found to be very very affordable yeah uh, much more affordable than bali uh, we ended up spending eighty thousand rupiah per day to rent out our motorbike again that was based off of the size of the motorbike they do vary between 50 to about 150,000 rupiah on Lombok Island. Um, again, ours was 80,000, but they do get higher. Now, the most expensive motorbike we did, I did rent not remember this. was in Bali, yeah, and it was 180,000 rupiah per day. But this was a very, very large, uh, very sporty motorbike. It was a very nice, almost brand new, I'd say less than a year old motorbike. Very comfortable very large capacity to store things and um, overall good good controllability of the wheel it was a, a very comfortable ride was it worth the 180,000 rupiah per day um, just depends do, do you want comfort do you want extra storage if that's something you look into or it's something you need then yeah I would say it was worth it what's 160,000 rupiah for most of us right um, that's the reason we go there is because it's more affordable so yes it is it is a, a good deal it is worth it if you need more storage and you want more comfort because if you are taking long trips on a motorbike your butt is going to be tired your arms going to be tired your shoulders going to be tired um these these uh higher end motorbikes are more comfortable for those longer rides so if you're going to be doing an hour or two on a motorbike then yeah go ahead and get the larger seats especially if you have a passenger um, like I did, um, the seats are a lot wider and they're just a lot more comfortable. They also have more padding and cushioning than some of the cheaper uh, motorbikes as well. Now, what are some essentials to carry with you on a motorbike? One of them is going to be your helmet, obviously. Um, you can get fined for not having a helmet on, although we never did. The Once we got more comfortable on the motorbike, um, we didn't use helmets also because the people we rented them from don't necessarily have the best helmets. Some were broken, some were cracked, or some just didn't have enough helmets to hand out. Luckily, we had already been there for so long that we were very comfortable on the motorbike. So we just opted to not, you know, not fiddle with the, the helmets because they even had any for, for one. But um, helmets is going to be one thing you want to have, especially when you start off with the motorbike. The next thing you're going to want to carry with you is a first aid kit. Why do you need a first aid kit? Well, because if you are a newbie on a motorbike, chances are you are more than likely going to get scraped, bruised, and more than likely fall off that motorbike, just like I did. I'll put a clip here in a little bit of what my gash looked like when I fell off the motorbike. This was day two of a motorbike, so still very new at this. Um, but yeah, you're going to see a lot of tourists that are just cut up from the legs, the arms, the hands, the knees, um, from falling off the motorbike. It's a very common occurrence. You're going to see a lot of tourists bandaged up, um, usually around the knees, usually around the legs, um, 
also because they get burned sometimes the, the muffler gets too hot and for most people we're not used to sitting on a motorbike so the leg gets too close gets a little bit burned or um, you fall off the motorbike again now you need a first aid kit you need to bandage it up things like that so if you pay attention you're going to see a lot of tours that have their legs wrapped up knees wrapped up etc um, that's the reason it's uh, very important to keep your first aid kit with you when you are traveling with um, on a motorbike we always get the first aid kit in our storage compartment um, whichever bike we got we got multiple different bikes while we were there we always put the first aid kit in there Okay, so, had a little accident. I'll show you right now. So what happened is, ran into a little patch of gravel. We we're trying to turn into this like little shop for breakfast. Um, it's only not that far from our destination. We're like, we'll hang out there. Well, as we were coming in, it slowed down, I thought, good enough, but the gravel just overtook that damn scooter. So, ended up falling, scrapping out my knee you guys all the blood that we get like this is not even the, the worst of it but yeah so i'm gonna go back to the first aid kit put some antiseptic into that cut and then uh, yeah continue on our day yeah guys so after our little fall there we carried the first aid kit pretty much everywhere we went since then um again that fall happened like on day two so for the remaining you know almost five weeks we had left on our trip we took that first aid kit everywhere now the next thing you're going to want to carry with you or purchase when you arrive there um, or even better purchase on Amazon and take it with you is going to be a phone holder for your motorbike. So there's two, two different types. You can see on the motorbike every now and then on my left hand side my phone <laughs> is attached. So they make some for your mirror and they make some for the handlebars. I suggest getting the one for your handlebars because most of our phones are pretty heavy. If you get the one for the mirror it's going to be bouncing around every time you hit any kind of little any kind of little bump on the road and uh, it's just going to be hard to to see the gps the main reason you want that little phone holder is for your gps Ooh, made it. because if not if you have a passenger the passenger is going to have to hold the phone um, which we saw plenty of people dropping the phones and having to go to phone repair shops in bali because they're holding the phone trying to look at the gps while somebody else is driving you hit a big bump there goes your phone so a phone holder is something that I wish I would have known um, before arriving, but that's something that you have to get if you don't want to freaking be without a phone in, in Bali. Um, if you are by yourself, you're going to have to be holding that phone or kind of memorize the, the map as best as you can if you don't have the GPS on display like I do here on my left hand side right now. It makes things super, super easy. Um, again, the one I have is for the handlebars, it's sturdier. Um, versus the mirror. The mirror is right there on top of the handlebar and it bounces around way too much and the metal that is, is used is a lot thinner than if you go with the one on the handlebar. So just um, FYI, they both work but the one on the handlebar stays steadier and uh, gets a better bite on the bike. I will leave everything down below in the description on Amazon if anyone is interested. You can check it out there, purchase it, that way you have it before you take off on your trip. Another quick tip is gonna be bring a towel with you or, or a piece of cardboard or something to put over your seat when you are uh, gonna be gone for a long period of time and that bike's gonna be parked in the sun. It gets very, very hot. You're gonna have to wait for your seat to cool off. Um, what I started doing since I was, uh, I didn't have a towel or anything with me, I would take everything out of the, the little compartment and I would just pop open my seat so that way it would be leaning against the handlebars and it wouldn't get the sun so when i come back put everything back in my little container push down the seat and the seat wasn't hot but if you are going to leave stuff inside your uh, little compartment or storage compartment i would suggest just bringing a towel or something to throw over the seat because it is going to be hot you have to give it a couple minutes before you really take off because it is hot for uh, myself and then for my passenger she would always be wearing shorts so it's even hotter on the skin versus me with uh, pants or shorts that cover my legs. So just a little quick tip. The next thing you want to do is when you get your bike, you want to make sure 
that you test those brakes out because these bikes get used by tourists so much the maintenance and upkeep on these bikes is not the greatest especially once you start getting to the smaller islands we went to Musa Lombokan and the bike we had didn't have brakes on the left hand side so um, they have brakes on both the right hand side the left hand side where my hands are um, I actually have my fingers like one finger on the brake just in case and they break really quickly but one of them didn't work the other one worked but not so great so just an FYI keep an eye on the brakes make sure that they work uh, good if you if you tell them right away that hey the brakes are not working so well they usually go and take them in and get them fixed or just swap you out with another bike but it wasn't so important for us on the brakes for Nusa Lampagan because the, most of the island is pretty flat but once you start getting into like a Bombok or into um, Nusa Panita or even some of the more hilly areas in Bali you're going to want to pray and hope that those brakes work because those grades on the roads are so so steep you will need your brakes because if not you will go off the road um, again for Nusa Lampagan it was pretty much a flat island but some of the other islands, like I mentioned, are not Hello. flat at all. And if you do not have working brakes, you're going to run into some problems. Okay. Now, to just kind of give you a quick little overview of the bike. Okay. So, the throttle is on my right-hand side where my hand is at. On the right, you roll it back and it gives it more throttle. Your horn and your blinkers are going to be on your left-hand side. On every single bike we had, it was always like that. Um, basically, it's just going to be a little switch that you move back and forth, left to right. Or blinkers the little horn is just gonna be like a little push button that you can reach with your thumb while you have your hands on that handlebar all your speedometer and gauges are going to be there on the top like you can see on the, on the right hand side there um, to open up your trunk or your little compartment you're going to want to turn the key um, midway you're going to want to turn it on and then midway crank it back about half a click midway and then you push a little button that's going to be next to your bike Right there by the key switch, there's like a little small button, you can push it. It's going to pop open your little compartment for storage. Um, this one in particular was the only one that didn't have it like that. You had to um, crank it all the way on and then crank it all the way back. And it had like a little unlock, you clicked it to the unlock uh, marking and it would pop yeah, over your truck. Every other uh, motorbike was the other way I just described. Now the next thing, a lot of tourists have issues starting their bike, ourselves included because we didn't know how to start this thing. Um, by the way, you can see that this road is really, really bumpy. Um, you'll be surprised that Bali is actually not that well developed with some of the more rural areas for the roads. This isn't Bali in particularly, but all the roads do look like that in Bali once you start exiting the high tourist destinations. But anyways, back to how to start the motorbike. When you start the motorbike, you're going to have to turn the key fob all the way over to where it says start or on. You're going to turn it all the way over. The bike is going to start lighting up. If it does not light up or if it does not make any kind of noise, it's because you probably have your kickstand down. You need to move the kickstand back up um, as if you're ready to go because I guess it's a safety switch in there. It will not let the motorbike turn on if that kickstand is down. So kick the kickstand up turn it over to on and then you're going to want to hold your brake on the right hand side and push the little button by your thumb on your right hand side push the little button in and the bike should start up again i'll repeat it again for anyone who needs to hear it again um, you take your kick stand up turn your key fob over to on on your right hand side squeeze the brake and click the little button by my thumb right there on the right hand side and your bike should go ahead and turn on now let's kind of talk about the road conditions for driving a motorbike, just for general safety of the road. The roads are not that great guys, whether it was Bali or any other islands, the roads are not excellent. There was patches in Lombok that were probably the best road we ever driven, driven on, but for the most part, they are kind of go at your own risk type of roads. I saw, for instance, I saw a big old hole in the middle of the road, this was actually at night. Um, it was a big old hole, probably about two feet deep, and they just had a post in there to basically alert drivers and hey, there's something here. But on a motorbike, this hole was probably about, I don't know, two feet wide. It was a pretty big hole. If I had not seen that, especially at night, I could have easily fallen into that thing and gone over and who knows, you know, what would have happened, probably broken bones or something, especially going at a high rate of speed. 
Again, these are not things that you expect coming from, for particularly for me, you know, that's a, a big no-no in America to have an open hole in the middle of the road. Um, there, it's kind of like, oh, we put a post there, um, everyone should see it, everyone should be aware, everyone should be driving with caution. So it's kind of, it's kind of go at your own risk type of thing. Also, when they do construction, they put a lot of that sand near the roads. Well, what happens is it makes the road very, very slick. So when you're coming around a corner, which kind of how, which is kind of how we uh, ended up falling, um, you hit a patch of sand and the roads go from asphalt to concrete, asphalt to concrete. Um, kind of irregularly, maybe you hit a patch of asphalt for miles and miles and miles. Then you hit a small patch of concrete. Well, where we particularly fell was a patch of concrete with some sand over it. Anyone who has driven on anything similar like that is going to know that it gets very, very slippery when you throw sand on top of concrete. So, again, there's no warning signs. There's nothing there to alert you. You just have to kind of be aware and notice that, oh, I need to slow down, or I can't make that turn too sharp because there's sand on top of the road. So just little things like that that we are not aware of. Also, there's a lot of potholes. There's a lot of bumpy, rocky roads, kind of like what you're seeing right now. There's uh, just a lot of pieces of, of road missing on the edges. When you pass a car, sometimes you can't pull over too far on the, on the left or on the right, um, or on this side on the left. Um, because there's so much concrete missing, you know, you're going to drop down about a foot or six inches and it's going to throw everything off. When you're coming around the corners, specifically where there's a little bit more traffic, you want to probably honk, especially if you're going to be traveling to like uh, Mesa Panita or some of these other islands where they have very, very sharp corners and you can't see what's coming around the other side. A lot of the vehicles, taxi drivers, and a lot of the locals on motorbikes will honk their horns when they're coming around sharp or tight corners to let the other driver on the other side know, hey, I'm here, I'm coming on the other side. Um, it's just a safety deal that they do. They're not being rude. When we first got there, we were like, man, these people are so rude, always honking. Because in America, honking gets kind of seen as rude. Over there, it's not seen as rude. It's more seen as a precaution or for safety. Now, another quick note. There are no grade limits over there. They're, the roads sometimes are super, super steep going up and super, super steep going down. There's, I don't really believe that there's any kind of re regulation on how steep um, a, a slope can be. So for us particularly, we've had an incident a couple times happen actually. I believe it was in New Zealand. The road was, it was actually going to hit the clean clean at Diamond Beach. The roads are pretty steep. Well, what happened was we didn't have a full tank of gas. We had about a quarter tank of gas. Well, as we were going up the hill and the gas began to move towards the end of the gas tank, well, the motorbike ended up stopping out on us midway up the hill. We, I mean, I couldn't even keep the balance and the bike was so damn heavy. Um, I just kind of laid it over a little bit, got my balance, and then I had to push, well, me and, uh, uh, and I had to push the motorbike up the hill and it was a pretty steep long hill uh, we were sweating towards the end after we got done pushing it up and again it happened again further up the road it's again because the roads are so steep and we didn't have a full tank of gas so we weren't getting enough fuel to the bike because the bike was you know on an incline that the bike would turn off on us so again just something to be aware of we didn't know what was going on but after, you know, kind of thinking about it as to what could it have been, that's more than likely what it was the cause, because it only happened when we were on steep we hills and only happened on two different occasions that were very, very steep. So, um, a word from the wise, make sure you have a full tank of gas when you're going to Clean Clean or Diamond Beach because the roads are steep, or if you prefer, get a taxi instead of a motorbike. Um, even even the vehicles were sometimes struggling to go up. We saw a lot of them just burning out tired because making that turn was so sharp and so steep that the vehicles were starting to struggle. So just FYI, keep a full tank of gas when you go to a lot of these other uh, islands like this. Now also on the roads, it's something that most of us are not used to is there's going to be a lot of dogs, a lot of chickens, and a lot of monkeys that are going to get in your way. 
particularly once you get to Lombok. Lombok had a lot of monkeys going over the roads, and if you just give them a good honk, they'll usually kind of scatter off the road. Now in Bali, there's a lot of dogs just roaming around that are sometimes not even in the best shape as far as health-wise. So even if you do honk your horn, I don't know if they can't hear you or they just don't care, but they would mosey on very, very slowly. So you would either have to slow down and go around them uh, without trying to hit them. So just an FYI, there's a lot of things like that that most of us are not used to. Um, again, chickens. Chickens are pretty pretty good about it. They would just kind of watch the road and run right in front of us, but they would at least get out of the way. The dogs were the ones that wouldn't really necessarily get out of the way all the time. Um, some dogs would, some dogs would not. I believe it's because of their health. I believe some of them can't see too well, so that's the reason they weren't really getting out of the way in time. I guess I shouldn't say in time because it makes it sound like they're these dogs, but they weren't getting out of the way in a timely manner, I should say. Okay, so now let's move on. So there is some parking designated for motorbikes, and there is parking designated for vehicles. So you will have to keep an eye on that, as some of the signs will say, you know, uh, motorbikes here, cars here. So if you're following a car, which is what we used to, we would do, we would follow vehicles because you know, we thought that was the right way. But when we follow the car, then we would turn around and maybe go around the building, uh, you know, half a block or a block down. So. Following a vehicle, yes, is a good idea also, but you are going to have to park somewhere separately. More than likely, most of the places have parking uh, separated out for the two uh, modes of transportation. Now, one thing to note is that parking is not free. Just about every place you go, you are going to have to pay for parking. We went to the mall a couple times. I believe we paid two or 3,000 uh, rupiah to park there. Some of the higher, more nicer, touristy areas we used about 5,000 rupiah to park there. So everything is pretty much paid, it's paid to park, um, except for maybe a hotel or things like that. All right, we'll go ahead and talk about some places not to go on a motorbike with. And this is coming from locals who live in the area, particularly on the Isle of Lombok. We had a photo shoot scheduled on Salong Long Beach. You haven't seen that before, I'm not really sure. Um, but it's in Lombok. It's quite a ways from the port where we arrived from. Well, our taxi that picked us up from the port to bring us to our hotel, you know, we got to chatting, we got to talking, asked us what our plans were. We told him, and he said, Oh, you're not going to have a motorbike, right? And I was like, Well, yeah, it's usually what we travel on. He said, Well, that's not really a good idea. And we kind of looked at each other like, why is that not a good idea? And he basically said that there is some crime that happens at night, particularly higher rates of crime for people on tourists who are traveling at night on a motorbike in that general area. He said a lot of drunk people and a lot of like little petty I guess, uh, robbery, they try to take your money or whatever. So, uh, long story short, we ended up canceling that, um, that plan to that beach because we were going to be doing sunset photos and our hotel was about an hour, hour and a half away from that beach. So we were going to be driving at night by the time we got back to the hotel. Um, so just little things like that to note that not every place is um, on limits. There are a couple places that are off limits. For tourists, as far as safety goes, you can still go there, but again, go to the risk. And uh, we didn't really want to chance it. We figured the locals know more than we do. They live here, they spend all their time here. So it's probably wise to take their advice. Uh, we did ask him to, um, you know, would he be willing to taxi us over there? And he said he would, but he would want to return as well before it gets dark. Um, he said sometimes we have to be So, um, yeah, if he, if he wasn't really willing to go out there, then that, that's probably not a good idea for us. Um, foreigners, tourists, to travel out there ourselves, by ourselves, without any really kind of knowledge of the area. Now, really quickly, what are some, some areas that are really hard to learn how to drive your motorbike? So, it just so happened, we picked the hardest places to learn to drive your motorbike. We've never driven one before, we probably picked one of the worst places to start. Um, we, we started driving in like Kuda, Chengdu, there in the island of Bali which when we were telling other people where we started, they were like, oh, man, crazy. It's, you know, it's very, very uh, high traffic areas. It's a lot of traffic, a lot of vehicles, a lot of bikes. 
and uh, yeah, I guess it could be a little dangerous for a first time uh, bike driver. So I wouldn't recommend starting off in those highly densely populated areas, touristy areas, because there is a lot of traffic. There is a lot of people who have more experience on the motorbike and they're kind of just zipping in and out and they may throw you off your course um, accidentally because you freak out because we're not used to that kind of stuff. So again, if you're gonna try to learn how to drive a motorbike, I suggest going on the outskirts of like Ubud or anywhere in that area where there's less traffic. And you'll notice as you start venturing out from like Buda, Jingu, Samanyak, um, it gets less traffic -y. There's still a lot of traffic, but not as much. So I, pref I would prefer, you know, starting off out there if I was to do this again. Um, also, if you're going to be visiting islands, Lombok is a good island to kind of practice um, on a motorbike. There's not as much traffic. If you visit Lombok and you visit Bali, you're going to immediately notice that the tourists are not really there. There's, there's tourists there, but not nearly as much as it is in Bali. Um, Lombok kind of gets the overflow from Bali, um, but again, it's a very easy place to drive because most of the land, for the most part, is flat. There's a couple, there's a new road that takes you along the coastline. That one is a little bit um, hilly, but not as bad as Nusa Penida or some of the other parts of Bali. And it's a very wide road, so if you do kind of screw up a little bit, like a little bit of uh, room for error to correct yourself. So that's the reason I like Lombok, not so much traffic in the roads. It's a very, very nice, nicely developed roads yeah. for beginners. Now, Nusa Penida, if you are a first time bike driver and you are trying to learn in Nusa Penida, good luck. You're going to have a lot of fun because <laughs> um, Nusa Penida is very, very hilly, very, very um, mountainous as far as the roads go, and this, the grades on the roads are very, very steep. Um, coming down and going up, so we are going to have a lot of fun trying to balance that thing, throttle, throttle it correctly to get the right amount of gas to go up the hill. It's going to be it's going to be an adventure if that's where you choose to learn how to drive a motorbike. There isn't as much traffic as Bali, but you're still going to have the difficulty of the terrain itself. Um, I would recommend again. This is something I should have mentioned earlier, but I would recommend getting a bike with some more power than you think because going up those hills especially like in Musa even Lombok in some areas you will need a little bit more power to kind of keep that momentum going up the hill because it is so steep. Now real quickly I'll kind of talk about how to kind of keep the weight balance as a passenger. Um, I had a passenger it was just easier if she kept the weight centered and let me do all of the steering and weight distribution because if she started to do any kind of weight distribution, it would throw me off and sometimes I'd have to counter that weight distribution. So it's just easier if the passenger just keeps their weight centered and start, instead of trying to help you turn, I found it just to be easier. Because sometimes the passenger may not know um, how much weight to put on one side and it can throw you off and that's how you can end up falling as well. Um, the next thing we're gonna talk about is Yellow Bridge. So if you, if you haven't, go ahead and look up Yellow Bridge and Musa Lamborghini. The Yellow Bridge is a small road that doesn't have room for vehicles. There is no vehicles for vehicles to pass through that Yellow Bridge. It's just for pedestrians for walking and for motorbikes. You can get two motorbikes across at the same time, but you have to be very, very careful. Sometimes a lot of the locals do haul materials and things in their motorbikes, so they have wider loads, so you're going to have to stop, pull over, and let them go. Um, you'll see in one of my videos that I had to stop, pull over, because the guy had a lot of, of tanks, I'm assuming propane tanks, in his motorbike. So I had to pull over. But uh, yes, the yellow bridge, you're going to hear it clanking as you're driving across. But uh, we made it along so just fine. It looks like it's been there for a while. But yeah, just take it easy. There's a lot of scary little roads that you're going to encounter in Bali. But I hope you guys enjoyed this short, well, not really short. I hope you enjoyed this longer video of me explaining just everything motorbike related. This is all information I wish I would have had before traveling to Bali. And as a first time motorbike or motorcycle user, um, a lot of this information I wish I would have had. So thanks for watching guys, I appreciate it. If you got any value from this, give this video a like, share, and a comment. If you have any other questions, again, drop it down below as well.
anything I mentioned in the in the video will be down below in the description for Amazon links to purchase. And without further ado, guys, be careful, be good, take care, and God bless. See you next time and continue traveling. Bye-bye.